Okay, our next topic. So there is a restaurant near Ottawa, and it's drawing a lot of the owner there is uh, drawing a lot of criticism over the menu and decor at that restaurant. So it's called the Manitou Bistro. It serves what it calls indigenous fusion cuisine. Uh, inside, you'll find a totem pole on display. Its logo appears to be uh, including teepees. But there are a lot of critics, and they are saying this restaurant is engaging in cultural appropriation and is making a mockery of First Nations culture. So in interviews on social media, the owner has identified as indigenous and French Canadian. So, you know, Celebrating culture through food, where is the line between celebration and appropriation? Yeah, I mean, this one has been all over my news feeds in Indigenous circles and, and conversations. And I think part of it is because she identified as Indigenous, but then also identified as Métis, and then it was Algonquin from Kitagon ZB. Um, and so there's a lot of shifting, which I think touched on a big like red flag conversation for Indigenous people, which is people appropriating Indigenous identity for some sort of profit. Um, and that's like one side of this conversation for sure that I think made people more critical off the get-go. But also, I want to say, like, even if she is Indigenous, say like her claims are like can be somehow proved and whatever, Indigenous people can still appropriate from other Indigenous people. So if she's saying, oh, I'm Anishinaabe, we don't have totem poles. We, we don't, like, you know, we don't. <laughs> I'm like, we don't live on the plains. We don't have the buffalo. Why do you have a white buffalo thing and saying it's like, you know, sacred and whatever? And so for me, I think that like, yes, it's different. Everybody always thinks that it's, you know, white people appropriating from Native people. That's certainly a different power dynamic for sure, but it's still not cool to do as an Indigenous person, even on your own. And I think that also the line, if everybody's like, where is the line between appreciation and appropriation? As soon as you start making profit, it gets tangly when you're profiting off of other people's cultures. Um, when you're, uh, you know, um, uh, also, uh, sorry, got so distracted. Yeah. I'm like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, and also when somebody from the nation that you're, you know, saying that you're appreciating says like, hey, we need to take this and slow down and you can't do it. That's a sign to me that it's more about you than it is about actually appreciating the thing that you're doing. I, I love that. This, obviously, as a non-Indigenous person, I come at this as the consumer, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, the, I hear everything you're saying and identity and who gets to determine what is your identity. It's not just who you think you are or who you say you are. Does the community you claim to come from also accept you as one of theirs? Yeah, totally. And it doesn't sound like that's happening from any of them that she claims she's coming from, you know, all of that. But as a consumer, I, you know, when it comes to food, I mean, who doesn't love food? Um, we were just out last night, and, you know, it's it, to me, that is on us in terms of buyer beware. If you want to go for a nice Italian meal, who's in the kitchen? Where are the recipes coming from? I, I'm just saying, in this city, it's not Italian people cooking in the Italian restaurants. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. So that's not to say, that's not to say it always has to be an Italian person cooking your Italian meal, but the story, the owner who's profiting off of this, their lineage, their history, their story, their connection to culture, it all matters. Um, uh, you may be familiar with this place, or maybe not. I went to Quebec last year, two years ago with my husband, and I purposely sought out Indigenous-owned uh, businesses because I thought, I speak with my money. I'm not Indigenous, but I want to support Indigenous communities. So we found, and I want to tell everybody about it, it's called uh, the Musée Première Nation. It's in Quebec, a place called Wendake. This is 100% indigenous owned and run. And this is a four-star hotel, the restaurant, which I think the chef has changed. I do want to say that now. But the community is part of this place prospering. But I'm a consumer. I need to do the research. So I, I say this to anybody who likes to travel close or far, speak with your money and do your research. That's how you can support it. I'm just thinking because I like I'm one quarter Italian, right? And Jason, my partner, is like half Malaysian, half Hungarian. Now, if we were we're not chefs, this is a ridiculous scenario. But if we decided that we were going to create a, like a fusion of Italian, Hungarian, and Chinese foods, which doesn't sound great, I'll admit. <laughs> but let's say we did that. I don't think I would feel like I have enough connection to my heritage to do that with any authenticity. But it's an interesting place because there is so much when you t speak of food and fusion, you can't not not talk about colonialism and then you can't not talk about power dynamics because I don't think anyone would be necessarily offended or upset if I did create this restaurant. They might not come because the food sounds bad, but <laughs> that, that I think that because those are, you know, uh, 
maybe there's it's less fraught right now because there has been so much fusion in those realms. Mm -hmm. I think when you start getting into more marginalized um, populations who haven't made money in the same ways as like European, like everyone's doing a French fusion something or other. So like, I just think you have to be careful with who's fusing what, but it kind of echoes what you're saying mm -hmm. and thinking about, but I'm, I, I'm hard pressed to be concerned about the Italian restaurant right now. And I'm willing to be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I feel like it's less concerning than what's happening sure, in this Sure, because story. Uh, it's not maybe considered a marginalized community. That's right, yeah. not so much anymore. Anymore, yeah. But it, it does get tricky when we talk about food and fusion as you're talking about, because oftentimes when we're talking about fusion, you're fusing like Western food oh. with a non-Western food. So it's like Thai fusion, it's Chinese fusion. And you know, there's, let's say for example, Chinese fusion, right? So you're like, there are lots of restaurants now that are like mixing in an elevated way, Chinese traditional items, and they fuse it with Western or French or whatnot. And then they get to charge because it's now fusion, it's sprinkled with westernized food, yeah. <laughs> instead of paying $6.99 a pound for the barbecue pork from the restaurant with the cat in the window going like this, right? <laughs> you can laugh, it's okay. I made the joke, right? Because you know, those restaurants with the cat in the window, you expect a certain price point that doesn't exceed a certain amount. You, we have been conditioned not to want to pay that much money. But then when you fuse it with some Western food, with some fancy bread or like, I don't know, some decor, decor, and then I don't know, whatever they do in the pan that reduces the sauce into something buttery <laughs> and French and you put it on your wonton, then you charge three times the amount. And that's where I'm like, oh, so do we need the sprinkle of Westernized food to, you know, make Chinese food more valuable? Yeah, mm. which I love if the owner of that is a Chinese person. Yeah. If they are able to then profit from this this sprinkling of Western, like if that profit, if that make that feels better yeah. than if there's a white owner in that. Does, does that feel better to you? It could feel better, yes. And I think there are some elevated restaurants that are Chinese owned and operated, and the kitchen is all like a, a Chinese and and all of that. But I think that the minute you get into fusion, a lot of times it's not a Chinese owner, right? right? Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's do a little. Let's do a little of this first. Riley, we always feel so great when you're here. You're so smart. Thank you for joining us as always. Hey there, what did you think? Drop your comments below and join the conversation. And don't forget to like and subscribe so you can find more on everything from food and fashion to pop culture and current events. See you soon.